Today is March 17th, and March 17th is, of course, St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day. In Boston, it's also known as Evacuation Day. So what is Evacuation Day? Well, we'll end up here in South Boston. But first, let's start with Henry Knox. Henry Knox was born in Boston in 1750. In March of 1770, when Knox was 20, he witnessed the Boston Massacre. The site of the Boston Massacre is marked by a small circle here in front of the old state house. Eight soldiers and four civilians would be arrested. Knox testified that he had tried to defuse the situation and convince the soldiers to return to their quarters. John Adams would lead the defense and six of the eight soldiers would be acquitted. But this wouldn't be the end of problems between the colonists and Britain. The next year, 1771, Knox would open a bookstore. It was advertised in Cornhill, opposite Williams Court. Williams Court is approximately where Pi Alley is today. The Cornhill section of Boston was adjacent to where the old state house is, and that section of town was demolished to make way for government center. Knox's bookstore proved to be very popular. Uh, among other things, he carried fine goods imported from England, and some of the books he stocked were about tactics and artillery, and these he read for his own enjoyment and would serve him later. However, tensions with the British would continue to rise in the years following the Boston Massacre. The Boston Tea Party would follow in 1703, as well as a blockade by the British to isolate Boston and a boycott by the colonists on British goods. Knox's involvement in the Tea Party is unclear, but history does record that he was standing guard on the wharf the night before, uh, preventing the offloading of British goods into Boston. In 1774, the British attempted to seize the gunpowder at this magazine in Somerville. This event, which became known as the Powder Alarm, elicited widespread anger among the colonists. Thomas Oliver, the lieutenant governor of the British colony, lived at this home outside Harvard Square in Cambridge. Following the Powder Alarm, an angry mob of colonists gathered on the lawn here and demanded uh, Thomas Oliver's resignation, and he and his wife uh, resigned and headed back to England. General Gage, the British commander, would continue to raid the countryside, trying to deprive the colonists of weapons. There were similar powder incidents uh, in Salem, Massachusetts, and in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. While the colonists were upset, none of these incidents caused any widespread trouble. This would change in 1775, when Gage ordered Francis Smith to march on Concord, Massachusetts. The colonists had been warned that a raid was coming, and this would send Paul Revere on his famous midnight ride to warn the countryside that the British were coming. Samuel Prescott rode that night as well. He actually made it to Concord, whereas Paul Revere was captured. William Dawes was another rider, but Longfellow neglected to mention Prescott or Dawes in his poetry. This is Buckman Tavern in Lexington, and on the morning of April 19th, 1775, militiamen from Lexington would face off against the British on a battle green just outside. This obelisk on the Lexington Battle Green was erected in 1799 and is considered one of the first war memorials in the United States. It lists the eight men who were killed that morning in Lexington, and seven of the eight are buried beneath the monument. Francis Smith underestimated the strength of the American militia. He took heavy casualties in Concord and was wounded himself. Later in the day, he was reinforced, but in the end, the British Army was repelled back to Boston. After the battles of Lexington and Concord, Henry Knox and his wife abandoned Boston, and Henry joins the Continental Army. It's good to note at this point that back in those days, Boston was more of a small island or peninsula, and once the British troops were forced back to the city, they were effectively trapped there, cut off from the mainland. Militias from all around New England began to converge on Boston to reinforce the blockade, among the Connecticut militia, there was a young soldier named Benedict Arnold. It's thought that Benedict Arnold was the first to propose an attack on Fort Ticonderoga, which was up on Lake Champlain in New York State. Realizing the fort was lightly defended and had a cache of heavy weaponry, Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys up in Vermont had a similar idea. When Arnold realized that Ethan Allen was already on his way to the fort, Arnold rode ahead of his men and pushed his horse past the point of exhaustion to catch up with the Green Mountain Boys. 
Arnold Allen and a contingent of Green Mountain Boys rode across Lake Champlain late one night and took the fort by surprise. They captured it without firing even a single shot. Back in Boston, a struggle began to take control of the high ground overlooking the city. Under the command of Artemis Ward, the Continental Army took up a fortified position on Breed's Hill in Charlestown. While the British Army was stuck in Boston, the British Navy still controlled all of the harbor. An amphibious assault was launched on Charlestown in what is better known as the Battle of Bunker Hill. Henry Knox served in an artillery unit at the battle. And while the British were victorious at Bunker Hill, they suffered heavy casualties. Perhaps too high in the mind of some. In July, George Washington arrives in Cambridge and takes command of the American army, supposedly under this tree. Although some sources think that Longfellow might be responsible for that legend. Washington would set up his headquarters at this house on Brattle Street in Cambridge. And 67 years later, Longfellow would buy this house. In any case, with the guns at Fort Ticonderoga captured, Washington puts Henry Knox in charge of retrieving them. So begins the noble train of artillery. In the winter of 1775-1776, Knox loads up all the cannons and weaponry onto sleds and uh, transports them down from Lake Champlain along the border of New York and then into Massachusetts and across to Cambridge. So today, historic markers uh, plot out the trail that Henry Knox took across Massachusetts. They start out by Great Barrington and continue to Cambridge. You'll find them in Westfield and Warren and Worcester and Wayland in Weston. This marker here is in Waltham. This marker here is in Watertown. This marker here in Cambridge Common can be found on the spot where Henry Knox delivered the guns to George Washington. The marker in Cambridge Common is actually within sight of the Washington Elm, which is where George Washington took command of the army. From Cambridge Common, the guns are transported to General Thomas. With cannon fire from other sections of the mainland as a distraction, General Thomas brings the cannon up to the top of Dorchester Heights in the middle of the night, using hay to muffle the sounds and not attract attention. The next morning, the guns are spotted by General Howe, who's in charge of the British Navy. Howe decides to attack Dorchester Heights, but is thwarted by a sudden snowstorm. This marker on Dorchester Heights is the last marker in the John Knox Trail. Secretly installing the cannon up here on Dorchester Heights was a real checkmate for Washington. Not only can he target anywhere in Boston, but all of his guns are out of range of the British Navy. General Howe, still stinging from the losses at Bunker Hill, decides to abandon Boston. George Washington receives a letter from the British threatening to burn down Boston if they aren't allowed to evacuate the city peacefully. Washington doesn't respond to the letter, but for the most part, the British are allowed to leave peacefully, and on March 17, 1776, the British evacuate Boston, which is where we get Evacuation Day from. While it's a coincidence that the British decided to evacuate Boston on St. Patrick's Day, the establishment of Evacuation Day as a Boston holiday has a lot to do with St. Patrick's Day. The bill that made it a law is actually signed in green ink. It's sometimes said that Boston workers were given evacuation day off so they could go over to Southie and enjoy the parade. These cannon here can be found in Cambridge Common right next to the Washington Elm. They aren't Henry Knox cannons. Uh, they are actually British cannons that were abandoned at Castle William on March 17th when the British left Boston. After the evacuation of Boston, General Gage is never given a military command again. General Thomas succumbs to smallpox and is buried in Kingston, Massachusetts. Back at Fort Ticonderoga, Bennett Darnold became very frustrated that the Green Mountain Boys would not follow his orders, so he headed north and captured another fort. 
Uh, he was unceremoniously replaced at that fort um, and feeling slighted uh, many times over the years, Benedict Arnold eventually betrays his country. Henry Knox retires to Maine. His home named Montpelier can be found in Thomaston, Maine, uh, along Route 1. It's run as a house museum now. And Thomaston is named after John Thomas, who received the guns from Knox and installed them on Dorchester Heights.